I, I took a look at these yesterday and I decided these will probably really good examples to take a look at some of the different colors that are possible using uh, various uh, native plants. This is really neat because of the, uh, a lo the majority of these were, were bandit rugs, bandit designs. The bandit rugs are traditionally like from uh, the Chinle area, wide ruins, kind of like the central, the going from the central part of the reservation, going a little bit southward from there. They produce a lot of these uh, bandit rugs like these. And to produce an even straight line all the way across is very difficult to do. These may seem simplistic in terms of their banding, but they're very, very, it's very difficult to keep that straightness even in, 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 in that, uh, uh, like, like a straight line here at the bottom. And a lot of these rugs, you can see how they vary. They, they shift, like from a light color to dark color to light color and when you go across. And then also, when you actually measure some of these, they, they vary in width as well, like from here, maybe to there and from there. So because of that, uh, of that uh, differences, that those little minor shifts and changes that goes right into our thinking of what we what we teach on in, in terms of uh, chaos and disorder, you know, beauty and imperfection. And it's also like, a, like in a whole day, how the whole day varies, like from sunny, cloudy, sunny, cloudy, and so forth. So you can see it, it's obvious in, 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 in these rugs here. And if you look at uh, the majority of the, uh, the orange yellow ones that are here, these are uh, orange yellow ones. This is uh, normally produced by, by, by plants that you call the Rumix, Canagri dock, the one that has a lot of big tubers in the ground. Uh, it'll produce like uh, these really neat uh, orange brown uh, streaks in here like that, that color. And sometimes uh, depending on the location and also the, the, the time of year that you collect Navajo tea, Navajo tea can also produce colors such as these uh, uh, yellowish orange colors, but not quite as uh, bright as what you see here. So seeing how bright it is here, really orange, I would think that this is probably, was probably dyed with uh, like rummocks, that Canagri dock, the roots of Canagri dock. Uh, the browns that you see, for the most part, they're, they're uh, natural uh, color, natural uh, sheep wool. Uh, I, I, I raised a uh, uh, sheep back home, and the type of sheep that I have is what you call the old Navajo churro type sheep. Uh, they have all ranges of natural color, all shades of grays, all shades of whites, all shades of blacks. Uh, you can have like all shades of like even like a reddish brown. And in Navajo, we call these the best which means the pet is the sheep, chi is reddish. So the reddish brown we usually get from these naturally uh, colored, uh, reddish brown uh, colored sheep. And that particular color of sheep is highly prized. They're more valuable than the gray ones or the black ones or the, or the white ones. So weavers that are out there, whenever I, I started a program where I used to run like about 200 head of sheep. And over a number of years, uh, every time I would uh, produce a fresh new crop, I would just get rid of the whole thing. So within a few, like maybe five years, I gave away over 750 sheep for free. You know, I didn't ask for a single penny for them. Because my intention was to have Navajo weavers to restart using the natural colors. And when they tried to go through the, the Navajo Churro Society, these, the, the, the members of the Navajo Churro Society would be quoted in these high, high prices. You know, like for a ram, they would say like $450. For a ewe, maybe $200. And I was saying, man, these, our elderly can't afford that. I mean, wh where is the tradition of, our, of giving, you know, in good spirit? So that's why I started setting up that program with them, and I gave them all kinds of sheep like that. And one of the things that I used to do is I used to I, I hand shear. All shear and hand. And I tried using the, uh, one time I, uh, on two sheep, I, this were exper experimental results. 
I use an electrical blade. But once the sheep started producing its, its, its wool again, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was really rough and coarse. So if you use a hand shear, like the old traditional way, when the wool regrows, it's real soft and even, and you know, it's not as coarse. And so what I do is uh, when I shear these, and I'll, I'll give them to like weaving families or weaving organizations or some individual, and I'll say, here, go produce me a rug. And I have several rugs where it's all natural colors of different shades. And so in, in, uh, these are probably where those colors come from, like the white and the brown. And also, uh, uh, like in this one here, the grays, these are all natural as well, like uh, that gray there. Uh, and the yellow band here, some, well, let me get back to the brown first. Some of this brown is also attain, uh, 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 obtainable by using nat natural plants. Uh, a lot of the modern weavers, they use uh, like uh, walnuts, you know. And, you know, traditionally we didn't have walnuts in the past. So it's kind of funky to see those uh, charts with walnuts on them, you know. <laughs> and so you would use uh, shrub oak, like uh, quercus, you know, the different types of oak, gambles oak. You gather the, uh, the brownish spark of those, and that produces some really neat brown colors as well. And then also, uh, like the same uh, rummox here. If you use uh, the rummix at a later stage when it's starting to get old, it'll produce some, uh, not, not as quite deep brown as this, but it'll produce like, come, kind of like a brownish color like that. Now the yellows here, these yellows are probably obtained like from uh, maybe uh, uh, artemisias, like sagebrush, or else you can get uh, certain colors of these, especially if they turn a little bit more brownish from like the, the chrysostamus. And here's a good example here on the... Uh, the rabbit brushes, uh, see, show. Here's one right here, kind of that, that shade of yellow, is a rubber rabbit brush. And uh, one of the things that I thought is really interesting about this piece here, see the lavender? The lavender color? That lavender is probably produced from, uh, from berries. You know, you can use like, a, like that, that little voucher specimen that I had of uh, holly grapes. It'll give you somewhat of a, a lavender color like that. But if you also use uh, a plant uh, called ribes or uh, squaw currant is another common name. Another uh, gooseberry is another common name. There's a, a particular species out there that we call, uh, which in just, I mean, something that you butcher to. And the berries of those, when you uh, collect those in the late summer, it'll produce colors that are that lavender right there, that color. Or a little bit more, a little bit more purplish than that, than that, that one over there. So that's how we obtain that particular uh, 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 dye color. You can show which one. Yeah. Okay, now this was kind of interesting. Uh, the, two, the two different blues here. See the dark blue and the light blue? Those are both uh, uh, natural dyes, vegetable dyes. Now the light blue here on this one, was probably obtained from uh, petals from blue flowers, you know, like uh, petals of, uh, of uh, what they call uh, lupines, like uh, lupinus. You get lupines and they'll, they'll produce this really light, faint blue color like that. Another thing that does that too, is, which is kind of dangerous, is, is the uh, uh, larkspur, which is uh, poisonous, you know. Uh, but you can obtain uh, blue colors like that. That dark blue there, but uh, the way I obtained something very similar to that is what I used was uh, I took, uh, you know, those common sunflowers that you see along the road or like in the waste, like fallow fields. You know, they have flowers about that big. And you can take the, the flower heads of those. And when you look at them, and this all depends on timing again. You get to a point when the flowers are still on, you know, the petals. The petals you can pull off. If you get a lot of it, pull the petals off, use that separately, and it'll, it'll produce a yellowish dye for you. And then you take the, the, the seed heads, the seed heads, and you use that as a, you put that into the solution and boil it. And I was using, a, uh, I believe, uh, a really uh, enriching alum uh, mordant, and I produced a, a really neat bluish iron blue dye like that color. And, uh, and it's probably something similar to what they use there on that side. 
Uh, some of the reds here, like this is, like I said, was, it was, we use uh, uh, mountain mahogany and also uh, the members of the, the, the birch family, like water birch, the uh, thin leaf alder. Within their lower part is where we get a lot of that reddish uh, uh, color from. And then on mild mahoganies, uh, the mahoganies, like the circle carpets, we have circle carpets montanus, which is mild mahogany, uh, circle carpets letifolius, which is more of like a mahabian. Then we have uh, circle carpets intercadus, which you find on slick rock, alone, exclusively on slick rock. Those all produce reddish dyes, you know, in, in their bark, if not also their root system as well. There's a small forb I like to, uh, I like to collect, in the, but the only problem is you need a whole lot of it. I mean, these forbs are probably about this big, and they grow in the sandy areas. Their, their roots are narrower than this, this cord here. And, but towards the upper part of their root, you might achieve the thickness of this cord here. Uh, but that particular uh, uh, plant, you can just take a piece of paper, go like this to the root, and pull it. And when you pull it like this, it leaves behind a really neat maroonish purple dye. So I think that's a really neat uh, potential dye plant that I'm going to try to use in the future. Another way to get this bluish color, who's ever heard of a, uh, uh, I try to give it a better common name. It's, uh, the, it's called toad flax, bastard, bastard toad flax. I, I call it illegitimate toad flax. So. <laughs> Uh, you find these in the, uh, in the wilderness, like in pinion pine forests, pinion pine uh, woodlands. Uh, the Navajo name for them is uh, which means the plant that has a bluish root. And when you pull out the plant, you know, there's nothing spectacular about it. The flowers are small, white, and you have to dig down into the root and pull out the root. And then even the root, when you pull it out, it, it has that brownish covering, the, 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 the brownish bark. When you peel off that bark, you get that blue color like that. So I think that's where this one came from. Okay, uh, this one here. The orange is probably, like I said, Canagri Dock. Some of these uh, browns are probably either Mount Mahogany or Canagri Dock. The green is probably from the, 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 well, this is actually a yellow that's in here that's mixed in with the gray. Like one, one line of one weft of yellow, one weft of gray, one weft of yellow, or two. So it kind of uniquely produces that greenish type of color. So the yellows on this one, I, I'm pretty sure it's probably the, uh, like uh, sunflower petals or like uh, uh, the uh, rabbit brush petals up on top. All right, next one. Oh, one thing I like to mention too is the black one. The black are produced by, uh, by sheep natural colored sheep. One of the things interesting about black is uh, the deeper the blacks are, the, the color, that means that the sheep is under a year old. It's like a yearling. It's been sheared for the very first time. Because on a, on a natural like black sheep, when, they, when they're born, they're really super black. I mean, almost jet black up to a year. And then after you shear them, their second coat that comes on in will produce kind of like a, a grayish black like that. And then the, as they get older, the older they get, their black gray turns to, to grayish color. Oh, just like that. Yeah, just like your hair, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This one is, uh, I thought was super, really, really neat. It's very busy. It has, uh, I mean, it has everything that I talked about this morning, about order, disorder, chaos, and, you know, uh, you know, how... There's so much uh, going on here. I mean, you can count all these and, you know, find all kinds of mis, uh, uh, imperfections here. And you see how these uh, grays and uh, darkness uh, uh, alternate, how they switch. So that, that's also, like, a, like, like I said, how they, uh, it's, it's their way to uh, create that uh, protection, is go, or their way to create that that feeling of uh, being in balance and out of balance at the same time. Now, the, the pinks here, the pink here on this one, these are probably produced by cactus fruits. You know, like the punty fruits, the, the top part, 
you, you uh, put, leave that in cold water and it'll produce a... Uh, this was probably left in the water for no more than two weeks. Like after two weeks, it would have been a lot deeper red than this one. Uh, let's go to this one over here. This is a, a very nice one here. We talked about all the colors, like uh, except for the, the greens here. See the greens there? These greens are produced by all different types of... Uh, you can use like... Uh, like the greenest stems of most plants, and you can use like rubber rabbit brush leaves, rubber rabbit brush stems. You can use the like alfalfa leaves or those uh, what they call uh, mellow lotus, which is a sweet clover. It'll produce like a, a greenish color like that, uh, kind of a kind of a dye like that. And uh, also uh, the uh, rummets will also produce green for you. Depending on the charge of the, the mordant, if you use an, an iron uh, ion mordant, it will produce greens that are much deeper than this in color, almost like a brownish green. So this is a, a really, really neat classic uh, bandit rug from probably from the Chin Li area. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, Kesh Chi Isha Inja. Oh, let me, while well, he's grabbing that, let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this chart over here. There's a young lady by the name of uh, <clears throat> uh, Linnell Washburn. She's from the Shibok area. And she, she kind of, she's one of my uh, apprentices that I'm teaching like uh, plants and uh, 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 producing dyes. She learned a lot from her mom and, and and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give her a little bit more insight as to what she learned. Her grandmother was actually the one that created the dye chart, you know. The original dye charts, they would be from around the uh, uh, Gallup area. They would uh, go down and produce dye charts for like the trading posts and the, uh, the different uh, tourist industry. So these dye charts are probably originally developed by that, by that family, from the Washburn family. And these are really neat because they show you how all the different variations of color that's possible from these different uh, aspects of plants. Here's what I call the, the ground lichen here. Lichen, uh, which is also used as a mordant as well. If you don't have like a, a mordant, like let's say you want to try Navajo tea. You might want to try this as a mordant. You might want to try alum. You might want to try iron oxide as a mordant. So each one of these different mordants will give you different variations, different shades of that color. And like I said, the, the walnut, they're not uh, native to the area. You know, you have to go further south, like uh, drop off the Mugion Rim, like south of uh, Flagstaff. And uh, starting that region, you'll start running into a little bit of walnut in that area. But we did go down into the, the lower country like that for medicinal plants, tobaccos, and dye plants as well. So um, here you have uh, the prickly pear. Uh, this one, I think, is, uh, was probably left in just for a short period of time, like maybe a couple days, where it just barely turned, like a, a barely shifted the color, but didn't get any pink or, or reddish coloration within, within, its, uh, within its color. Now, the, the sumac, you get this really dark, kind of blackish color coming from sumac. And oftentimes, uh, they mix that with uh, juniper, burnt juniper berries, you know, burnt juniper uh, uh, scales to get that really rich uh, black color like that. And then, like I said, you get the petals, you get that yellowish from the sunflowers. If you use, like, especially the, the larger sunflowers, if you use this portion of it right here, including the, the whole flower head, that will uh, produce that iron blue color that I, uh, that I mentioned. So that's the portion that, of that uh, plant that, we, that you would use. Now onions, uh, these are more of the commercial onions, the, the onion skins. We have a natural onion called uh, Allium uh, cernuum, which is the nodding uh, onion. Uh, it grows up in the ponderosa pine zone, and that's the one that we use for uh, our dyes, that we use the, the peels because they have a, a membranous uh, cover on the bulb of, that, of the onion. So uh, that, that's what we use to 
also get that color from that natural uh, onion that we have. Uh, Oh, cochineal, yeah, that's a... Uh, is that ever used in... It's, it's used, co cochineal is, is used as well. It produces like a really, kind of like a blood red yeah. dye. Mm -hmm. uh, cochineal is, you'll find them on prickly pads like that. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's a bunch of, like, maybe somebody tossed out some tissue paper or something, and it got rained on, it's been sitting there for like a whole year, and just kind of won't come off. And so you start scraping that off, you know? And you get to the bottom of it and you squeeze it, you get all that blood red color off of that. So if you collect enough of that, that's also will produce some really neat reddish colors for you. Yeah. If you're using um, like lichen as a model for a specific dye, um, is there a difference in processing? Uh, it, 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 you might get a, like if you're, uh, if you want traditional like yellows, like light yellow, yellow. Uh, the more I, I wouldn't recommend, like you, uh, like sometimes if you use that more, it'll turn kind of like a reddish brown, like a brown. And we have like uh, two other species that, other than this one here that we use. So uh, on, on itself, uh, also like I said, depending on the what you collect, what time of the year you collect the, even the lichens. It varies. You no, know, sometimes it might be produce a little bit more brownish color than that. So, depending on your your objective, like if you, if you have light colors and you don't want want it to turn kind of like more of a darker color, then you uh, then I think it, it'd be better to use a a metal mordant, metal uh, ion base. So, but yeah, there's a a lot of acids in that, you know, in, in that uh, in that brown lichen. Uh, let me see. Cliff Rose. A way it's on. That's, uh, the stems and the leaves together will, uh, produce that, that color for you right there. And here's, uh, the, the lupines that I talked about earlier. It'll produce like a bluish gray sometimes, grayish color. And here's sumac. Sumac is also, oh, actually sumac is here. This one here is uh, probably like, a, like some type of a rose, like a woods rose. Cho. And you get a, another shade of yellow coming off of that. Uh, here's an a Indian paintbrush, or being politically correct, Native American paintbrush. <laughs> uh, those also produce kind of like a like a pale reddish to kind of like a pale brown reddish dye. The flowering tops are, is what we use up on top. There's a, a little uh, greenish uh, floral part that sticks out from the flowers. They call it the galea. You can pull that out, suck on it, and get your sugary treat off of that. Uh, let's take a look at these over here. Here's another... Uh, Here's an, an example of a, of a moccasins that were dyed using uh, natural plants. And I, I mentioned earlier, this is the, uh, probably the, the, uh, the normal color of the, uh, of the, uh, of the wrapping, the, 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 the wrapping that goes around the, the whole moccasin. This bottom portion is usually very tough leather, like a rawhide. And what they do is they, they'll make you step on a like on the ground or something, you know, like a piece of paper, and they'll trace your foot out. And then this is how they cut it out based on how big your feet is. Maybe they might give it like a quarter inch more all the way around. And then once they produce that, the the wool, I mean the, the leather would be that color. But what they do is uh, on, on, see the reddish part? What they would do is they would uh, put this in the water, lay down that, that uh, leather in the water, and let that water soak up, soak in the whole uh, leather. And then what they would do is they would take uh, uh, juniper 
scales or the leaves. They'll burn it and then they'll rub it in there. I mean, really rub it in there. And then once they do that, then they'll get mild mahogany. Start boiling it, the roots of it, and they'll put this leather into that mild mahogany. And then once it boils, like for maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you take it out and then you have a solution of thin leaf alder or water birch on this side, their, their bark. And then you take this one back into that one again. And then what it does is it, it's a two-step process. And what it does is it, it enhances that really deep reddish color like that. It, it's embedded in, your, in, your, in the leather. If not, if you just do like a, a one-step process, sometimes it's a little bit color like that. More of a yellowish red. So these are also dyed in that process using uh, plant dyes as well. Do we have any questions? Is there a reason for wanting them to be red? Uh, red is kind of like the natural color of the earth. It connects you with the ground, the earth, because you're connected to, to the ground, you know. Mm -hmm. And like uh, the way they see it is like, uh, like uh, if you have... Like your, your whole body, it, 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 it emulates the, the atmosphere, everything around you. So you have your body that's connected to the, to the earth, your, your, your ground. And there's these points of intersection where things are, are represented by. So from my feet to my ankles are all the small flowering plants, all the grasses on the earth. From my ankle, from the ground ankle to my knee, is the pinion juniper woodland. On this side is ponder, uh, pinion pine, and on this side is uh, juniper. And then all the little animals living here, like the coyotes and the rabbits and whatnot. And then you start moving up your body right around this area. You, you start uh, where the raptors are at, like the birds and raptors. Up to your shoulders is the Douglas fir, the ponderosa pine, the larger trees in the forest. So you're going up in elevation as well. And then your, your head, your thinking, is connected to the universe. You know, that's why they, they, they tell you to aim high, because your thinking should be way the heck up there, you know. You know, not, not at this lowly earth level. And then your hair, it comes back down like rain. Your hair is the rain that comes down from that, you know, from the atmosphere. So your whole body emulates that nature as well. So I hope you guys didn't have an overload here. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I was, I was really, I mean, this was the highlight of my day yesterday when I first got here. And, uh, I had uh, uh, them run off a copy for me. This is a uh, a sand painting rug in part of the collection here. This was uh, woven by Hastin Nestlaja, means Mr. Left Handed. Hastin Nestlaja was a very you know a very unique individual. He's probably perhaps the the greatest nightway chanter that we've ever had. The nine day nine night ceremonial of the Navajos. It took him 20 years to learn it. He learned every branch of it. There's, there's not just like one main chant, there's like four or five major branches that branch off the nightway chant. He knew the, 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 the full length of that, that's what he, uh, he's an expert in. And he, he also knew the full nine day, nine night mountaintop chant. He knew the Chiricahua windway, he knew the windway, he knew the big star chant, and then he knew the, the little star chant. He knew the waterway and the beadway. And this was the person that wove this rug. And he's the very first one that started to, de to develop these. And people were, were scolding him, saying that, you know, something's going to be bad, it's going to befall Hastin Nestlaja, because you're not supposed to make these permanent. But when they, when he did this for several years, then they decided, you know, maybe, you know, uh, there's protection from these, you know. And it was through not only the, the support of uh, Mary Cabot Wheelwright, she was a rich philanthropist from Boston, and she spent all her wealth and her time 
going down to Newcomb, you know, sitting in on Hastinus Ajah's ceremonies. And what she did is she, her and Frank Newcomb, they d- described the ceremonials in detail. They took down the, the sketches of all the sand paintings. And it was a way, I don't know how N- Hastinus Ajah saw this, but he saw this in the future, saying that we're going to start losing these. And right now, we, we've lost the big star chant, the little star chant, the feedway, part of the waterway. So if it wasn't for these ladies, all that stuff would have been only have been known in name only. We wouldn't have known about the sand paintings. We wouldn't have known about the, the stories, you know, the, the rituals involved. So that's how Hastin Nestlaja preserved all this knowledge for us. And this is a, a classic... Uh, sand painting of a, here's the, uh, the central part is the emergence hole. And you had the, the bandit, uh, uh, like little bars here, and those represent rainbows. Like uh, the, the holy people, they travel by rainbows. They, they will go like this and flick it out, and the whole rainbow will go like this, and they'll step on it, it'll be like an elevator. Like uh, as they you know, move into another location, and then uh, so these these little bars that's what it represents. Not only that, but it also represents uh, uh, moisture. You got the classic uh, uh, traditional plants from the middle, and you know what we call the three sisters. I like to say four sisters, you know, because the four sisters: tobacco, corn, bean, squash. Tobacco, you know. Tobacco is important. Tobaccos were always incorporated into our traditional garden. What does tobacco do for us? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a repellent. It will repel other insects from getting onto your, onto your crops. You can take tobacco, put it in water, spread it all around your garden, get rid of your pest that way. You can take tobacco and chew on it when you're shearing, you just spit on where you cut it, and it's an antiseptic. So that, that's how tobacco is used. Uh, and then these are the different uh, uh, deities that are represented. These are probably like rainbow gods representing the four different uh, directions. And then you have a rainbow god that, that protects the whole painting. And the opening is to the east. So this thing should be laying this way to the east like that. And then the... Uh, these are probably uh, up on top. They're maybe like water beetles. They're like protectors of that particular uh, of that particular sand painting. So, sand painting rugs are very unique. You know, they're they're they come directly from ceremonial parts of uh, the Navajo uh, uh, teachings. And with has seen this uh he comes from a family of very super, super fine weavers. Like the, uh, what's that, Daisy Toschi, you know, perhaps our, our, our greatest Navajo weaver ever. She was making weavings with wefts of up to like maybe 140 wefts per inch. And that's super fine. And those are like tapestries where you just look up and they're like, you see the light right through them, you know. You know they're, they're, uh, they're really, really nice. So he comes from that family, and that, that's how this was all developed. My dad, he comes from Newcomb, and this was part of his uh, great-granduncle, Hastin Nestlaja, and that's why we know a, a, lo- a lot about him. So this was very special to, to see that, you know. Is this the, the book is written about? Yeah, Hastin Ta, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is one of his rugs here that, that, that's here on the, in their collection. And my, my grandmother, this is how she started off. She made a lot of these, all natural wool, all natural colors, natural uh, dyes. While she was producing these, that, that's when I started helping her, learning about the dye plants. She did uh, what we call the, the, the big star chant of the star people. And it's kind of neat because the big star chant is our commemoration, documentation, and our actual observance of Venus forming the sky. 
And the, the, the star people, we have like the red, yellow, white, and black. So this was thousands of years before NASA came up with that color scheme of stars. Because we've been out there, our Navajo stories, we've been out there in the universe. We, we visit the star people. We know of the red giants. That's why we have red, and red star people. We know of our yellow sun. And that's why we have yellow star people. We know of the white dwarves, the quasars, you know, the white stars. And we know of the, the brown stars as well. And we know of the black hole. Why do we, how do we know of the black hole? It's because Coyote put it there in the very beginning. And that's how, you know, uh, that, that rug that she made is like that. And then she makes another one called the, uh, uh, it's part of the mountaintop chant where the bears follow each other. Yeah, this deity that's standing there holding on one side like a different colored corn. And then there's a bear that's following her of those deities. On the side that the bear is following that deity, the deity is holding up a bag of tobacco. Then bears smell that tobacco, so they're following that scent. And so... It shows it like this, but it's, it's uh, two deities with a bear walking like this, you know. And then she, had, she made another flag where it was like a cross. It has a black god here, coyote in the middle, first man, first woman, the, the sun, the moon, and the thunderbird. And it's a, a story that depicts uh, how coyote stole fire from black god. Black god is, uh, embodies the whole universe. He's totally black. And all the stars and constellations are on his body. There's so many of them that the, the, the Pleiades is depicted right here on his temple. And when you, uh, uh, the, the black mass that you see is his whole body. And he's also in charge of fire. So when you look at Coyote uh, on, that, on that particular painting, you'll see at the very tip of the Coyote uh, where, the, where, the, where it comes in red, you know, there's like an ember that follows an ember trail. Then from the tip of his nose, the ember trail continues to the first man and first woman's fire. First man and first woman is a bright star with Polaris as their central fire. He had the Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper right there, you know, over on the side. So that's the reason why Coyote has a black tip nose and a black tip tail. We're still in the fire and giving it to mankind. See, it's really neat, you know, a lot of novel stories, they, they, they talk about that, how the, the different animals got their different colorations, their different patterns, and so it all goes back to these old stories like this. Yes? It's uh, traditionally always been female, and lately we've been having a I think right around Hustina Sludge's time, we started having more male, a little bit more, the start of male weavers. And, but uh, it's, it's a, a craft that's traditionally given to the, the ladies to work on, you know. Well, I'd like to thank you for thank you. providing me your time and your ears and your attention. Yep.